Welcome and Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this year's first Ask the Ataxia Expert Session. I'm Lori Shogren, and I will be assisting with today's session along with a few of my colleagues. So before we get started, just a couple of things to note. Um, I wanted to note that closed captioning is available for today's session. To enable closed captioning, all you have to do is click on the closed captioning button, and that's found on the bottom of your screen, and then select the show subtitles option. Questions for our speaker can be typed in the Q&A. The Q&A button is found at the bottom of your screen and will answer as many of your, your questions as time allows. Please just use the chat feature for communication between attendees and not for submitting your questions. So questions, um, just submit through the Q&A button. All right, so we're so grateful to have Dr. Susan Perlman joining us as our ASK Ataxia expert today. Dr. Perlman is currently a clinical professor of neurology and director of the Ataxia Center at the UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles. Welcome, Dr. Perlman. Thank you so much for inviting me back. And good morning, good afternoon to everybody who has joined this. Um, I am extremely excited about National Ataxia Foundation's um, ongoing new initiatives. I just wanted to cite two or three things that, that are new and, and I think extremely helpful. Number one is that over the past year or so, they've redone the website and now have included um, pipelines for drugs in development for each of the common ataxias um, so that you can go to the nafataxia.org website and if you have one of the common known genetic ataxias, you can actually look at um, the pipeline of companies that are, that are developing drugs um, and bringing them into clinical trials. I think the second thing is they've started a new series of webinars conducted by you know, many of my colleagues um, who are involved with NAF and, and run ataxia clinics, looking at genetic questions and other things. And I think the third thing is that the um, conference this year is going to be in person so that I'll actually be able to interact with people face to face. Um, and there will also be a virtual option for people who can't physically attend. So there, there's been a lot of growth um, in outreach by National Ataxia Foundation. And I think you know all of us patients and practitioners alike are are very excited and, and have been helped by these initiatives. So I noticed that a couple of questions got put into the chat as opposed to the Q&A. So let me look at the chat questions first and then we'll go to the Q&A. There is a, a question from Leslie. I am a 64 year old female who developed ataxia last year. She indicates it was idiopathic. During most of her past year, my gait has been swinging far left, staggering around, communication issues. Since then, most of her symptoms have gotten milder. However, still having issues daily with balance, disorientation, um, feeling like jello, some issues with thinking, and impact on sleeping. So in my experience, is it common to have such a swing in ataxia symptoms? So ataxia, you know, whether it's genetic or um, non-genetic, classically progresses slowly over a period of time. There may be good days and bad days, but to actually have a period of time where everything seems to be better is unusual unless you have started some kind of treatment either physical therapy or a medication for some of the symptoms, or if the cause of your ataxia was an acquired factor that is going to partially resolve itself so that ataxia caused um, after an infection um, or is a complication of um, a vaccination um, will typically flare up um, symptoms will, you know, increase over a few weeks, and then they may stabilize or slowly improve over time. Similarly, if someone had a small stroke, which affected balance and coordination, 
um, you know, as the stroke heals over six months or more, symptoms will typically re reduce and the brain itself tries very much to um, make up for, you know, any deficits, you know, new connections amongst brain cells will appear um, and, and there will be, you know, a drawing on reserve. So I, I think, you know, if, as Leslie has commented, um, you know, an onset of ataxia followed by, a, 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 you know, milder um, symptoms um, as opposed to worsening symptoms, those, those are the things I would, I would think about. The symptoms of ataxia that Leslie points out are very common with cerebellar disorders of all causes. Balance, coordination, changes in thinking, um, speed of memory, um, emotional changes, um, as well as changes in sleep and other daily, um, daily functions. The second question that came in through the chat um, I am 65, uh, a man, and got diagnosed with spinal cerebellar ataxia type 2 with a borderline repeat abnormality. Um, he has a sister who um, has also taken the test and tested negative, and he wants to know what he had so they, they can both have gene tests done. Um, so they had additional testing done. Um, and were found to have um, NPC Neiman Pick type C1. Um, so the question is, is there another test that is newer and more conclusive? So pointing out that with the dominantly inherited genetic ataxias like spinocerebellar ataxia type two, there is a normal range for the reading in the gene test. There's an abnormal range where the gene is clearly abnormal and is expected to cause problems. And then there's a gray zone, a borderline zone, where, you know, depending on other genetic factors, other lifestyle factors, the mild change in the gene may not cause any problems at all, um, or could at some point cause problems, or could be passed on to um, a, a child um, and become more abnormal, um, expanding its mutation from that borderline range to um, a range that is expected to, to cause ataxia. So I, I think the questions here, um, what to make of that borderline reading? Is this a risk for that individual's children? Could they have inherited that borderline gene and it expanded to a, a more disease causing ataxia gene, but also regarding any ataxia symptoms that the patient and his sister may be experiencing. We know that Neiman Pick type C can cause in older individuals an ataxia syndrome, even though in children it may cause a more severe genetic disorder. So it sounds like, um, and, and I don't state, the gene DX testing that was done in 2019 may have been done by whole exome sequencing in order to identify the mutation in Neiman pick type C, um, in which case, is there another newer test that might give more information? So whole exome sequencing, um, in the last uh, three to four years since the gene DX testing was done, probably has advanced in being able to identify more genetic factors that could be involved. Um, so people who have had whole exome sequencing um, and may have had nothing unusual turn up or had something turn up that was unclear um, can have that test reanalyzed. They won't have to have new blood drawn, but the DNA that is, um, you know, being stored at GeneDx or other genetic testing facilities can be reanalyzed for newer genetic factors or more clear interpretation of genetic factors that were seen. So I'm now going to go to the Q&A list and 
you know, one of the first questions um, is what is my opinion of stem cell therapy? So work with stem cells has been going on for many years now. Um, initially, um, it was looked at as a possible way to um, replace nerve cells that have been damaged, for instance, in stroke and spinal cord injury. And that research is still going on. And it's not clear that it has been successful. Um, exogenous stem cells, stem cells derived from other sources, when infused into an individual, it's not clear that they can actually go in and replace nerve cells that have been damaged. I think a more um, interesting and potentially more successful approach is going to be treatments that will stimulate your own individual stem cells that are in your brain. They've never developed into brain cells. They're just sitting there as stem cells and can be stimulated to develop into nerve cells, potentially replacing nerve cells that have been damaged either by a genetic factor or um, you know, a non-genetic factor. Now, there are companies that are working in stem cell research in ataxia, um, either in non-genetic ataxia as inter interested in multiple system atrophy or in genetic ataxia as has been going on um, by the Steminent company in Taiwan um, and other groups. So the question is, infusion of these stem cells, do we really expect them to replace missing nerve cells or can they be used to stimulate nerve growth factors that will allow your own stem cells to grow back? And I tend to favor that latter um, interpretation, but much more research needs to be done. We're fortunate in that some of the early studies of stem cells in ataxia haven't shown any severe side effects or severe problems. Um, potentially have shown some benefit, and we hope to see this moving forward in, in the future. I think the only downside of participating in a stem cell trial is that um, you know, if you participate in it and, and a stem cell is injected into your body or a group of stem cells, you may not be a allowed to participate in other drug trials since you know, those stem cells may, may still be there, um, they may not be active, but if they're still in your system, they could still have an impact that would cloud um, the results of, a, of another trial. So I know that you know, when you sign on for a stem cell therapy trial or a gene therapy trial, um, you know, the lingering effects of those trials may, may um, exclude you from, from other trials. Um, then Carolyn has a question. I get dizzy from turning my head. Sometimes I may need to turn it a few times to really experience the dizziness. Is centrally caused dizziness in ataxia with family history always caused during active eye movement or head turning maneuvers? Can centrally caused dizziness occur when eye movement and head turning maneuvers aren't actively occurring? perhaps from problems with the central vestibular nuclei or from a channelopathy. And I would say, yes, that central dizziness as opposed to inner ear mediated dizziness can occur without eye movement, without head movement. It'll typically be worsened by those um, things, but dysfunction of the central vestibular nuclei, which are intimately connected with the cerebellum, could generate sensations of dizziness or disequilibrium without any movement at all and are very, very difficult to, to stabilize and treat and sometimes can be more disabling than more, more, more disabling than the actual balance problem itself. So any ataxia patient who has experienced central disequilibrium, who has some good ideas how to control it, I know the rest of the group would very much want to, to hear about that. Then a question about genetic testing. Is there a way to be tested anonymously? That depends on um, 
the group that is facilitating your testing, whether it's a um, you know genetic counseling group being ordered by your physician through um, you know a medical institution. Um, I know at my institution, anonymous testing is becoming more and more difficult. Um, you can register under a pseudonym, but you know a fake name. But in, in the system, it will be linked to your medical record number, which is linked to your real name. So I think the ability to get anonymous, truly anonymous testing is becoming harder and harder. On the other hand, if you sue genetic testing, not through your insurance company, but by self-paying through you know, um, a, a testing laboratory, um, at least your insurance company... It looks like Dr. Perlman is having some internet connectivity issues. So we'll just give Dr. Perlman a minute, see if her connectivity issues are resolved here. Okay. We got you back now? Yeah, I'm back. I don't know how that happened and I apologized. And I was just expanding on, on the need for confidential testing. So I, I don't think I said too much more after I cut out and I apologize right. for that. How do I get tested in Georgia? You know, I think the best way to find out is to go through your genetic counselor or your neurologist um, who can hook you up with a laboratory that can do test and will be covered by your insurance, or at least will be accessible to you if you decide not to use insurance. Now, here are a series of questions about spinocerebellar ataxia type three. Um, having the SCA3 gene assures either that you will be, let me go back to the top there, either you'll develop the symptoms or not. Um, if you have a mutation in the gene, that is in the range that deranges the function of the gene, you will develop symptoms, um, whether earlier in life or later. Um, but a mutation in that gene will, you know, will assure that there will ultimately be symptoms. What are the common mistakes regarding the psychological aspect of SCA3 patients? Now, I don't know what mistakes you're referring to, but we do know that the cerebellum is involved in coordinating not just balance um, and fine coordination, but it's involved in coordinating speed of memory and thinking, multitasking, and also coordinating emotional responsiveness. So even though in SCA3 and some of the other SCAs, there isn't you know, a clear risk of dementia or a clear risk of bipolar disorder, there can be um, some irritability. There can be an increased risk of depression and moodiness um, uh, fielded by the, the cerebellar dysfunction. Its treatment, however, would be the same as any depression or any irritability or anxiety experienced by a non SCA3 patient. And I think it's important to discuss with your neurologist um, that. Um, you know, that you're having emotional changes um, or, or changes in, in, in memory and thinking, so that can be addressed. Now, a question about the use of trazodone or clonazepam to sleep plus stimulant drugs to stay awake. Um, is this a solution to recover the circadian rhythms of a SCA3 patient, or is there more to lose on this kind of approach? So, you know, we often think about non-ataxia individuals out there who take uppers and downers, um, you know, downers to go to sleep, to calm anxiety, uppers to, you know, increase their, you know, uh, attention span and, and mental focus. Um, and we know that many agents that are used as stimulants or as sleep enhancers are what are known as, as habit-forming or addictive agents. 
Now, that leaves them open to abuse, which you know we hope is, is not going to be the case with somebody who has a medical need for them. But dependence is a problem. Um, using a drug like clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine in the Valium family, you know, as you continue to use it, it may become less effective. Your body gets used to it. And it's, um, I think it's important to recognize that with many of these, you know, habit forming drugs that your body gets used to, um, they, they may stop working at some point. And as you increase the dose, you may be more prone to side effects. Um, I think trazodone as one of the antidepressant family, which is a, a strong serotonin drug that is mainly useful for, for sleep and, and not so much for, um, for depression these days, may also have side effects. Um, so that, you know, these drugs, you know, any sleep enhancing drug should be used carefully. Um, and, and you should, you know, certainly speak with your prescribing physician about your response to it. Now, using a stimulant drug to wake up, if you're trying to wake up from a sleep producing drug, maybe you need to modify the sleep producing drug so it doesn't leave you hung over the next day. However, fatigue in ataxia is very common. Um, so that many people, even with a perfect night's sleep, you know, will complain of fatigue um, over the course of the day. Um, so there are lots of strategies for this pacing activities. You know, a good exercise program can, you know, sometimes, you know, improve endurance and, and can help with um, energy levels during the day. Um, and some people will use um, stimulant drugs like Ritalin, methylphenidate, and others if there's no other way to um, keep them, you know, awake um, and, you know, having enough energy to get through their daily activities. And again, this needs to be discussed with your prescribing physician. Pros and cons of testosterone replacement therapy in men, and I would like to say sometimes in women, with SCA3 in elderly age and loss of muscle mass. Now, this has come up with other neuromuscular disorders, um, you know, where aging in men may reduce testosterone levels and testosterone replacement, um, you know, may be helpful with muscle mass and also um, strength. Um, and low-dose testosterone replacement therapy has been used in women in some conditions as well. Um, however, testosterone can have side effects. It can worsen prostate-related issues, and it can have other side effects that would need to be monitored closely. So it is certainly not a first-line treatment for um, you know, an older person, an older man with loss of muscle mass, but it can be discussed. SCA3 can lead to delusional states um, or some kind of patient behavior. Um, you know, can it do this from other changes, lack of sleep, dehydration, infection? Absolutely. But as we said, there can be cognitive and emotional changes um, that can result from the cerebellar dysfunction. And it needs to be approached, um, you know, independent of the cause to see what can be done to, you know, improve the person's um, state at that time. What are the main concerns regarding patients' partners' life health impacts? Um, and I think this question is referring to the individual um, who has you know, a partner living with them, um, has a caregiver living with them. And you know, I may be interpreting this wrong, but we, I think we're all very aware of um, caregiver stress, caregiver burnout, and the need to support caregivers and partners um, who are living with and working with someone with ataxia. Um, and this is where, you know, working with um, support groups, working with um, counseling groups and individual or, or partner counseling can be very helpful. And sometimes people are afraid to step forward to admit that they're under stress or to admit that they want to start seeing a counselor, but I think it's something that you know, we recognize is helpful and we need to overcome. And then um, the final um, thought about SCA3, selecting embryos without the SCA3 gene is a good way of not perpetuating the disease. Um, and this goes back to um, 
the um, in vitro fertilization where you can um, select embryo embryos for implantation who are gene negative. The technology and insurance coverage for this procedure has improved over the last 10 or more years that it has been going on. And I, I think it's, it's something a couple can discuss with, um, with their, um, you know, uh, neurologist and, and with their, their gynecologist um, and obstetrician. Then, um, are there any MSAC trials proceeding um, uh, or ataxia trials anywhere um, that I feel positive about? Developing a successful trial depends on having a good agent. And the drugs in development are, are much better targeted and much more likely to be successful than some of the agents that were tried 10 or more years ago. So the MSAC pipeline, which is not posted on the um, Ataxia website, but is posted on the MSA Coalition website, um, does uh, talk about anti-inflammatory agents, which have had a couple of trials that haven't been very successful, talks about um, upcoming trials that are in process now that can target the abnormal protein that is building up in MSA. Um, one is the Lundbeck trial, the Amulet study, which I think is closed to enrollment. And then one is the Takeda trial, which is just starting to enroll. So I, I think these, you know, should be pursued um, and, you know, they will give us more information about possible next steps, you know, for multiple system atrophy and certainly for the genetic ataxias, there are very active pipelines in development. The only trials that are active currently are the Biohaven trial of troriliazole, which is close to enrollment and may hopefully be approaching the FDA for approval um, in the next few months. The Biogen study of a gene blocking therapy, as it were, which um, is currently in a phase one low dose trial um, and is going to be reorganizing their protocol because the FDA has some safety concerns, um, as well as the CELOS trial, which is an intravenous um, infusion of trehalose which is felt to help break up the abnormal protein that is building up in SCA3. Um, and, you know, certainly people, you know, should, um, you know, explore um, any trial options and you can get um, links to um, look at these trials through the NAF website. Um, how can is a taxia diagnosed? Um, the primary diagnosis is, you know, symptomatic and examination. If you're having symptoms of imbalance or other things that can be caused by the cerebellum, if your exam shows imbalance or other changes that can be caused by the cerebellum, then a diagnosis of ataxia can be made supported by a brain MRI, which may show thinning or changes in the cerebellum. The diagnosis from that point is going to go into non-genetic causes, um, acquired environmental or lifestyle things that, that could cause ataxia, immune system problems that can cause ataxia, or on the other side, exploring genetic factors. Um, and our ability to make genetic diagnoses is improving, although within patients where we strongly suspect a genetic diagnosis, I think there's easily one third that we have not found the genetic factor yet. Um, and then further on, I see a question from Jeff uh, who has episodic ataxia type two interested in trying for aminopyridine or dalfampyridine, which is the same medication. For aminopyridine was a compounded chemical that has been available for many, many years um, by compounding pharmacists. And dalfampyridine is the FDA approved prescription agent, um, which um, can be obtained by prescription and is also used by compounding pharmacists. So they are the same medication. 
some concern about potential side effects, um, overdose, um, using too much, accidental overdose, and, and the risk of a seizure as, as um, a, a side effect of, of a higher dose is a worry. But um, if you stay within dosing parameters, not exceeding 20 milligrams per day, um, the risk of a seizure is, is minimal. And other side effects are also very, very minimal. I think it would be important if you have had a seizure in the past from any cause or have some kind of risk for a seizure, a brain injury or having had a stroke, which can lower your seizure threshold, then using a drug that could trigger a seizure should be used very, very carefully. Um, the, um, have there been any cases of people taking the recommended medication who have experienced seizures? In my practice, I have not had anybody at any dose who's experienced a seizure but it is a risk and, and needs, to be, um, needs to be monitored. Um, can I speak to the new drug going through FDA approval? Um, and I'm not sure what new drug is being referred to. Um, there is one drug that is going through FDA approval now, and that is omovaloxalone which is a drug aimed at improving mitochondrial function, energy production in Friedreich's ataxia. Um, if it gets approved, and we hope to hear in, in the month of February that, that that will be the case, it will be approved only for use with Friedreich's ataxia. Um, and you know the work that the Riata company did in doing their studies you know, approaching the FDA, working with the FDA to, to get to this point, um, you know, being able to balance out benefits, being able to demonstrate benefits, being able to minimize side effects, I think is a model that all the other drugs in the pipeline for the other ataxias um, could, um, you know, could be used to, to speed up the approval process for many of the other drugs in the pipeline. Now, I had mentioned that troriliazole um, is hopefully on, uh, on uh, a road to FDA um, approval that, you know, they're putting together their final data analyses, getting ready to um, approach the FDA um, for permission to submit a new drug approval application. And we're all hoping it will be this year. And I don't have any more information than that. Now, there's a question here from... Uh, uh, an anonymous attendee about types of pain they might be experiencing with SCA3. Now, typically, ataxia, pure cerebellar ataxia, does not cause pain. It's involvement of pathways outside the cerebellum that can trigger pain. So with SCA3, there are multiple connections outside the cerebellum and other nerve pathways that could be involved that could cause pain. For instance, SCA3 and possibly some of the other um, genetic and non-genetic ataxias can involve peripheral nerves, causing a peripheral neuropathy, which could be painful um, and can be treated with gabapentin and many other medications used for peripheral nerve pain. Peripheral nerve involvement may cause muscle spasms. And there's a long list of medications used to relieve muscle spasms, whether they occur at night during sleep or occur during the day. Um, and involvement of upper motor neurons, other nerve pathways from the upper brain may cause spasms as well that can be treated with um, baclofen, tizanidine, um, and, and other agents and other treatment techniques. The basal ganglia um, are a separate movement area that um, is involved in Parkinson's disease, for instance. And in some of the ataxias, um, especially the genetic ataxias um, and MSA, the basal ganglia may have problems functioning and may cause a kind of muscle function called dystonia, um, which can be painful and can be treated again with a variety of medications. 
um, that um, and and can also be treated by Botox injections. So I think you know pain is something for independent of its cause, genetic, non-genetic, ataxia related, non-ataxia related, that can be directly treated with agents other than um, uh, our opiates or, or narcotics. And, and I think we need to look at those, you know, to avoid use or overuse of narcotic agents. Now, um, I'm going to kind of scroll down to the middle of the questions um, since we're, you know, a little over halfway through our hour. And I apologize, you know, that, you know, many of these questions we won't be able to get to, and they are excellent questions, all of them. Um, and I think, you know, NAF will hopefully um, get some kind of question answer chat thing available so that all of the ataxia docs who participate in webinars can be available um, to put comments in um, about you know many of these wonderful questions that that are being um, being uh, brought up. Now here's one from Anne. Um, it is known in sporadic ataxia for your legs to jump and twitch. Um, and, and this can happen with genetic ataxia as well. I do take medications, but it's moving into my arm and getting worse. It's not a pain, but it's a crawling feeling. Now, the crawling feeling of jumpiness or twitchiness um, can sometimes be a side effect of medication. So I think that needs to be, that needs to be thought about. But there's also um, a condition called restless legs, which classically occurs in your legs at night, but can occur in any body area during the day as well. And that crawling feeling is a way that that is sometimes described. And you know the way that it is often treated is with agents that can improve dopamine levels, things like carbidopa, levodopa. So I think this is a discussion you should have with your prescribing neurologist um, to see if there, there might be a way to, um, to address that. Now, here's a question from Lisa about SIN1 um, that, you know, she suddenly um, collapsed last year and developed moderate ataxia and worsening cognitive impairment, has been tested by a number of specialists, and her comprehensive ataxia panel showed a mutation in SIN1. Um, do you only test relatives if they show symptoms? Now, SIN1 is a recessive disorder. It requires a mutation in both copies of the gene. Um, it can come on later in life, as opposed to other recessive disorders that are typically presenting early in life. Um, there are many changes in the SIN1 gene that are known to disable the gene. And there are other changes that may appear on genetic testing that it's not known if they're going to disable the gene or not. Um, and it, it is coming up more and more on comprehensive ataxia testing. So the question about testing relatives. Um, if a relative um, is in the line of inheritance of having inherited this gene. Um, certainly a sibling who could have inherited, um, you know, the same two bad copies of the gene that, that Lisa did. Um, you know, they can be tested pre-symptomatically as long as they're age 18 or older. Um, given that there's no treatment yet for SIN1, sometimes early testing to see if you're going to develop it May, may not be helpful. It's not going to open up any treatments at this point in time. But other people who not are in a direct line of having inherited both bad genes could certainly be tested for carrier status. Um, since the, the presence of the SIN1 gene mutation in the general population is relatively common, um, so that carrier testing could also be done. Now, how can my doctor tell if I have ataxia or Parkinson's disease? Um, this is from Roger. And, you know, as his mother had Parkinson's, um, he's decided that Roger may also have Parkinson's. However, the levodopa has not been helpful. 
So there are some genetic ataxias that can present as Parkinson's. Late onset, milder forms may look like Parkinson's and are you know, certainly risk genes for Parkinson's-like disorders. So you can have Parkinson's symptoms with a mutation in a spinal cerebellar ataxia type two with no obvious ataxia. Um, so I, I think this is the discussion to have. There are inherited forms of Parkinson's as well, which can be identified genetically. So I think genetic testing would be helpful in sorting out, is this an ataxia, an unusual ataxia presentation, or is it a genetic Parkinson's? Um, the fact that the levodopa has not been helpful, while for idiopathic Parkinson's, garden variety Parkinson's, it usually helps, I think is another reason to continue to explore genetic factors. Now, Ramiro has a question. If a patient has an allergy to a certain drug, is there any way he can take the drug without having an allergic reaction? So it depends on how severe the allergy is. I have had patients whose allergic symptoms were itchiness or a rash, um, who were able to take um, antihistamines or other anti-allergy drugs and continue taking the medication that was prescribed for their ataxia. However, if the allergic reaction um, is something that causes difficulty breathing um, and could lead to a more severe reaction like anaphylaxis, or a more severe skin reaction, then that drug and other drugs in that class should be avoided. And you, know, you should not try to cover it up. So it depends on the severity of the allergic reaction and your response to some of the um, anti-allergy medications that are still available. So Mary has a question. I am constantly clearing my throat. Is this common with ataxia? With ataxia affecting coordination of swallowing, most of us, you know, we make saliva, we have phlegm, we have a post-nasal drip, and we automatically swallow without even thinking about it to keep our throat clear. With um, ataxia, that automatic swallow could be a little incoordinated, and saliva or phlegm might build up and then you would sense that it's there and you would have a need to clear your throat. So yes, it is common. Um, it means that you have to be more focused and more aware of your swallowing, more aware of your walking, more aware of hand coordination if you're planning to do something. So I think anybody with ataxia has to be able to perform all of their daily activities with increased awareness um, to assure success. Now, Karen has an interesting question. Are you familiar with eye disease of optic neuropathy or optic nerve atrophy with SCA28? I am not familiar with that. And you know, if a patient brought this to my attention, um, I would have to go back and look at you know, the published data about that. However, regarding um, ataxia type seven, we know that vision involvement is very common. And it was brought to my attention by a patient with ataxia type one, that there can be eye involvement later in the disease as well. So I think as we are diagnosing more forms of ataxia, and the dominantly inherited ataxias are up to ataxia type 49 or even 50 at this time. And as we follow more individuals with these rarer ataxias, we will learn more about them. And so it's, I think it's important um, to stay in touch with a neurologist who's willing to work with you to listen to what you're experiencing and, and note it so that you can then keep the rest of the ataxia community informed. Um, is there any chance that a pre-symptomatic diagnosed person, genetic SCA1, will never develop serious disease? So this, I think, is the problem of, well, not a problem, but just challenge of pre-symptomatic testing. You know you're at risk, you get the gene test, you find out you have the gene. So 
being able to predict whether you will develop serious disease depends, number one, on the size of your mutation. It's expected that larger mutations will have symptoms that come on earlier and may progress more seriously or more rapidly. Also, how other family members who have symptomatic disease have, have been doing with their disease is a good guideline about how the disease may run in your family. There may be other genetic factors that are protecting you. Um, there may be anti-aging genes that are protecting you. And also we know that lifestyle can influence how um, the presence of an abnormal gene will present. So I, th I think it's important to you know, follow research, have good health habits, um, and look forward to the development, um, certainly in the genetic ataxias and hopefully in non-genetic ataxia as well, of treatments that can slow progression and turn what could have been a, a very large disabling mutation into behaving like something that is, is, is smaller and, and um, easier to compensate for. Now, let me move to you know, the bottom third of questions. Um, Luis has an interesting question. Are there any documented benefits on TENS or NEMS, which I presume is a form of neural stimulation in the physical therapy space for muscle recovery. Now TENS I'm very familiar with, and I know that there can be other forms of stimulation for muscle that can reduce muscle pain, which can improve your ability to participate in physical therapy and exercise programs. And I know that there is muscle stimulation technique that can increase muscle bulk. So if you have muscles that are thinning, either because of you know, disuse or non-use in your ataxia, um, or because the muscles are also impacted by your disease, there are techniques to increase muscle bulk, which could technically increase power in muscles as well. So these are rec recognized beneficial strategies for use in physical therapy, and, and could absolutely be explored. Um, then um, there's a question from Cynthia, which I think is going to be an important one for many people. I'm a 60 year old woman with DNA confirmed SCA6. My abilities to work um, had left my employer to ask me to go on disability. My question is um, the wait has been five months or so. Um, does the government need more education on inherited ataxias? Okay, lots of, of um, factors in this question. Number one, why did your employer ask you to go on disability? Did your work involve you in activities that could be dangerous because of your symptoms of ataxia? Are you involved in activities that you just can't perform anymore um, because of your ataxia? In which case, could your employer have transitioned you to a different job description in the workplace that would accommodate your ataxia symptoms? I mean, that is key. Um, more and more, you know, uh, you know, the, the disability protections for people with a variety of disabilities, you know, are, are, are at the forefront. And, and I think that's an important question for your employer. So it sounds like you've already applied for disability now. Short-term disability, whether it's through um, you know, a, a private short-term disability policy or a government-sponsored, usually state-sponsored disability, is usually immediate, um, that you can go on disability you know, within a month um, and collect for you know, upwards of a year while you apply for long-term disability or Social Security disability, which you know, is, is government-mediated. Now, oftentimes the weight is, you know, you know, probably, you know, the government disability offices are overwhelmed. Um, they are understaffed and, you know, haven't had enough time to really review the documentation you've provided or documentation hasn't been complete enough and more documentation should have been provided early on. But I think you're right that the government does need more education on the inherited ataxias. Um, and all the inherited neurologic disorders. 
recognizing that um, they may not be as aggressively disabling as Lou Gehrig's disease, but certainly, you know, need that attention and support from these government programs. And I know the National Ataxia Foundation, the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance, and other organizations have been working on raising awareness at all government levels. Now, Robin has an interesting question about Agent Orange exposure, and I would say other toxic exposures um, in the military, burn pit exposures, et cetera, and cerebellar ataxia. And we certainly know that um, the VA has done extensive research on Agent Orange and does recognize that it can have long-term effects on the brain, which might include um, effects on the cerebellum or reducing reserve to allow other factors causing ataxia to present. And I think the same with burn pit exposure. Um, there are industrial toxins and other toxins that are known to target the cerebellum um, and cause ataxia all on their own. And this needs to be recognized um, and, and documented. Um, there's an interesting question about riliazole in the context of um, you know, the troriliazole that has been um, working its way, hopefully, towards FDA approval. Now, we know that troriliazole is metabolized into riliazole by your body, so that if you are taking riliazole, up front, um, this is actually the active ingredient in troriliazole. Um, it's handled a little differently. You know, blood levels and brain levels might not be as even uh, or reliable as this newer formulation from Biohaven. Um, but um, it, you know, certainly riliazole um, as an agent on its own has been investigated. Um, in Europe um, as a symptomatic and potentially disease-modifying agent in genetic and non-genetic ataxia. And there is some published evidence that it may slow progression and may improve symptoms of ataxia. Um, now, some of the side effects of riliazole include dizziness and tiredness. And ataxia patients may already have dizziness and tiredness. So you know, I think, you know, if you're going to be starting a trial of riliazole for benefit of symptoms and potentially long-term use, recognize that those could be side effects. And that if you haven't noticed benefits on ataxia, I would say within three months of starting riliazole, there may not be a symptomatic benefit for you. And we need more data on its long-term use as, as a possible um, slowing of progression. Now, Melinda has a question, any advancement in the treatment of SCA-8? Uh, the only trial that has been um, ongoing and established is the troriliazole trial, which included patients with SCA-8. Um, as to genetic um, therapies in the pipeline, you know, we can look at, at the pipeline um, on the NAF website, but there are no active trials that I'm aware of anywhere um, for disease-modifying therapies for SCA-8 at this time. Um, does, ooh, Sue has a, an interesting question. Does ataxia affect the vagus nerve and its functions? Um, the vagus nerve is part of the autonomic nervous system. It's involved in cardiac function. Um, it's involved in other um, non-voluntary motor functions. Um, some ataxias do have autonomic involvement, um, and, you know, SCA-3 is one of them. Whether it's on the basis of the vagus nerve, whether it's on the basis of the central nerve um, sites for, um, you know, the origin of the vagus nerve and other sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve pathways, I, I am not sure but I, I think we're recognizing that although the cerebellum is at the um, center of the cerebellar ataxia symptom complex, other pathways that connect with the cerebellum and are regulated by the cerebellum may also be involved. Um, so, you know, we need to, you know, enlarge our landscape of symptoms that we can relate to the ataxia. On the other hand, you're not immune from other disorders. 
So any new symptom that comes up that seems unusual for ataxia, don't write it off just to the ataxia. It could be, it could be something else. Now, um, Ivelo um, has a question about, is there a way to rule out MSA um, or is this not possible? There is no specific test for multiple system atrophy. The definitive diagnosis can only be made after death at autopsy by seeing the buildup of the alpha-synuclein protein aggregates in the nervous system. However, there is a very um, accurate diagnostic criteria which can help um, look at an individual, their age, the type of symptoms they're experiencing, you know, whether it's um, ataxia or Parkinsonism or autonomic symptoms, um, the um, other associated symptoms that can be involved, sleep disturbance and bladder disturbance can be very early symptoms. There are appearances on the brain MRI that are highly suggestive of MSA, but I have patients who have been diagnosed by these criteria with multiple system atrophy who have turned out to have other disorders. SCA3 can look like MSA in some individuals. Canvas can look like MSA in some individuals. And these are both genetic disorders that can be tested for. So I think, you know, the diagnosis of MSA still requires very rigid criteria and ruling out other causes. Now looking, um, let's go to the end. And I apologize if I'm skipping over other good questions that people have. Um, most recent question to come in, which SCA is most common and which is most rare? Well, I think in um, North America, SCA3 is the most common. Um, while in Europe, depending on which part of Europe you're in, SCA2 could be more common. In Japan, um, SCA1 is common in certain areas. So I think as we gather more information about SCA around the world, we will find that um, it's, you know, in certain areas, you know, certain causes of ataxia, genetic and otherwise, are much more common. And then um, Jian, Jinan, Janine, excuse me, says, is there a relationship between Lou Gehrig's disease and ataxia? The SCA2 mutation is a risk gene for Lou Gehrig's disease. Smaller mutations in SCA2 that may not be enough to cause ataxia have been found in populations of people with ALS to have increased their risk of ALS. Um, so I think that research is ongoing. Um, and within SCA2 families, there is an incidence of motor unit involvement you know, where the motor nerve and muscle twitching and atrophy can be seen, which is reminiscent of ALS, but is not classic ALS. And its change over time is not the way an ALS patient would progress. So is there any way to control or delay ataxia? I think good health habits, taking care of the rest of your health so that you don't complicate your ataxia symptoms with you know, other conditions. Um, but also, I think the, the foundation for treating ataxia is rehabilitation, a good home exercise program, consulting with a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a speech and swallowing therapist. These rehabilitation strategies always help um, and can be designed to meet your very specific needs. And I think we've reached the end of the hour now. And you know, as I've looked through the remaining questions on the Q and A, there are so many really, really good questions. And I hope that you know other people who participate in Ask the Expert and hopefully online discussions will get to address everyone's questions. So th thank yeah. you very much. Thank you doc so much, Dr. Perlman. We did get a lot of questions submitted. Thank you all. And hopefully um, you all will take um, more opportunities if you did not get your question answered today to participate um, in forums like our Facebook group online or our Taxia conference, which will have some specific uh, sessions 
including our birds with feather sessions, which is a great place to bring questions as well. And Dr. Susan Perlman is actually going to be one of our speakers for our upcoming conference on doing a general session on the topic of medications and diet protaxia and also participating in our birds of a feather sessions as well. So I know that um, our team is going to be um, posting a link to find out more information about the conference in the chat. So I do recommend if you have not been to a conference to check out information about attending the conference. So not only be an in-person option at Planet Hollywood in Las Vegas, but also a virtual option to attend the conference as well. So see, hope to see you all there. And just to let you guys know that there will be a recording of today's session. So if you wanted to go back and reference any of the information here, or share this with others who might not been have been able to attend today. Uh, we will have a link to of a recording of today's session on our webinars page that has also been uh, posted in the chat. Uh, but that is all we have time for today. It was so good to have so many of you here today and we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming conference and at our upcoming webinars. Thank you and take care everyone. Bye-bye.